State Representative Jared Patterson of Frisco, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So you proposed a social media bill. Mm -hmm. How would this work? How would it be enforced? Well, you know, look, I, I want to be very clear. I think this is one of the most important things that we could do next session is to protect Texas kids from these huge social media companies that target them with these algorithms that take them down these deep and dark holes online uh, and give strangers access to our kids. Uh, it is a very dangerous thing. In fact, I believe that it is the most dangerous thing our kids have legal access to in the state. Um, it's, it's that big of a deal. How it would work is that uh, social media companies would be barred from doing business uh, with minors. Uh, there would be an age verification process. And then also parents would be given the ability to remove their child's social media pages uh, if they so choose. And so, you know, there's kind of a multi-step process there, but the bottom line is we're gonna keep social media companies from doing business with minors. And so as far as what, an 18, would, is it 18 or below or is it below 18? It's below 18. You know, look, we have, we have a series of laws in this state to protect the physical health of kids. You can't buy a handgun, you can't buy alcohol, you can't buy tobacco. There's certain things that children in the state of Texas that young people can't do legally to protect their physical well-being. And I believe that it's time that we put their mental health at the same level of importance as their physical well-being. And so, but how would it be enforced? Mm -hmm. Because you talk about you know, keeping the social media companies out. Yep. But at the end of the day, if a parent wants to grant their child access, isn't there gonna be a loophole for that? Well, you know, the social media companies themselves can't do business with minors, period. Uh, they have to have an age verification uh, process for any person that wants to come onto their site. And so those are really big steps. From an enforcement standpoint, we would empower the Attorney General's Office of the state of Texas to go after these social media companies if they choose to go around this law. And what do you say to those who say, this is big government at work here, and you know, sh let the parents figure this out? You know, I think parents need help with this. Um, I really do. Uh, we've heard that. I think what's uh, kind of crazy probably for most people to understand is that a student publication at the University of Texas came out just this week uh, stating support for my bill. You know, I mean, these are young people who grew up with this as a critical component of their life, and they're saying, we need help. We need to get kids off of social media. You know, look, it, it, it's one of these things that we've learned about over the last decade or so, as we've seen a spike in self-harm and suicide rates and anxiety and mental health uh, disorders, our kids are killing themselves at a clip that we've never seen before in the history of the state of Texas. That's a really, really big deal. At the same time, it's coincided with this rapid rise of minors being involved in social media. I believe the government has a duty to protect the citizens and the residents of the state of Texas, and that's what I hope to do this session. Do you anticipate any organized opposition? To oh, absolutely. I think that there's a reason why Congress hasn't passed a meaningful uh, regulatory uh, bill about the internet in 30 years. Think about how much the internet has changed. Think about how, I mean, social media platforms didn't even exist the last time that Congress passed a meaningful reform to how we use the internet. And it's because these social media companies don't want this to change. They want the maximum number of users. They want to grab you and force you, hook you into their product, or else they wouldn't hire child psychologists and put them on staff to figure out better ways to hook these kids onto their products. Um, you know, they don't want this to happen. I think parents do. Um, I think if you ask them, young people understand uh, the addictiveness and the problems that exist with social media. And I've heard from a lot of parents here in my house district and specifically here in Frisco that agree with me on this issue. I wanna ask you about another uh, bill that you filed, education related, and that's the start date of a school year. Yes. Uh, and you want it so that school districts cannot start, unless they're, they're all year districts, uh, until after Labor Day. Yes, so, right? that's correct. Talk to me about the why of that. You know, there's a number of reasons why um, on this one. You know, it started with a comment that I made on social media about, uh, on Twitter, about um, uh, starting the school year later because of how hot August is. You know, to me, as someone that's an energy professional that works in the electricity industry, it makes no sense at all that we would be cooling down some of the largest buildings in most communities around the entire state of Texas during the hottest month of the year. Uh, you know, you look at where my kids go to school here in Frisco ISD, they got out in mid-May. May is multiple degrees cooler on average than August is. 
So getting out in mid-May and going to school in mid-August uh, just really doesn't make any sense from an energy demand perspective. And so I think from the problems on the grid, I think that's one big reason to push it back. Another one is, is that we're, we're eating more and more into these kids' summers. Uh, we're eating more and more into the teachers' summers. Remember, the teachers have to go back even before the, school, the kids do. And, and so, you know, we had teachers in our area that were back at the end of July this year, uh, back in school, preparing for our kids to be back in the, in the middle of August. And so it's just kind of gotten out of control as these schools, districts, uh, kind of stretch these schedules out to practically being year-round school. And so there's a number of reasons, but it all started with the health of our grid. And it would shift the school year back though, right? Like yes. To probably June. Right? Or, or, or at least the end of May. You know, here in Frisco, we got out in mid-June. And you know, districts have the, I'm sorry, in mid-May. I'm yeah. sorry, let me rephrase that. Yeah. Uh, here in Frisco, uh, we got out in mid-May. And so, you know, then we did, went back in mid-August. You know, we could shift that by a few weeks on either side. But even if it pushed it into the first week of June, it's still cooler temperatures on average than what we have in August. Uh, it just makes no sense. And in a state that's growing the way that we're growing with our peak demand hitting a new record just this year, uh, coincidentally, when school had already started uh, for most Texans, um, it makes no sense to be cooling those buildings down the hottest month of the year. Is there a rallying cry for this? And the reason I ask is because I remember state law used to be, well, maybe a decade ago already, that the school districts could not start until the third Monday of August. Yes, that's correct. And then all of a sudden, it was it was creeping back up, and now it's in early August, yeah. mid August. So I'm wondering, um, is there really a rallying cry around this effort? Well, look, when I was out knocking doors in my campaign, this is not something that I heard from voters at the door. Okay, that this wasn't more important than the economy. This wasn't more important than border security. Uh, so let's be clear, you know, about kind of where that ranks uh, in the grand scheme of things. But it's something that I've, I've just picked up from rumblings from other parents and from teachers uh, about how we, we're starting earlier and earlier in the summer. And so just from those rumblings uh, and then, you know, with, with my background in the electricity industry and looking at this holistically, like, you know, why are we cooling all these huge buildings? I mean, most communities in Texas, these are the largest buildings in the community and we're cooling them all down in the hottest month of the year. It just doesn't make sense. Um, let me ask you about some other bills that have uh, been proposed. Teacher pay rate. Yes. And increasing funding for public schools. Mm -hmm. Where are you on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, teacher pay was probably the biggest regret that I have from last session that we didn't get that done. Um, you know, it got caught up in, in you know, these other uh, issues that were going on. But let me be very clear about teacher pay as well. The state of Texas doesn't set what teachers make. Local districts do. Uh, the only reason that you hear state legislators talk about teacher pay is because we can't trust the school administrators to send enough of the funds down to the teachers compared with what we give to them. So when you hear about a state legislator talking about teacher pay, you're talking about earmarking specific dollars for teachers because we can't trust the other guys there to give the money to teachers. So is that something that you would support? Absolutely. You know, we've, we've got to increase funding for our teachers. We've got to increase funding for our special needs kids in Texas. A lot of districts, if you look at their budgets, they're losing money uh, financially on uh, some of the special education resources that they provide. So those are two of uh, the areas that we've got to uh, bump the, the funding up on this next session. And I spoke with Commissioner Mike Morath, mm -hmm. the CEA, and I asked him about one bill that's out there, and I'm sure a number of the lawmakers are proposing it, that would switch from an attendance-based model to an enrollment-based model. Mm -hmm. School districts would want that. Yes. He opposes that. Yes. Uh, where are you on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, our current funding strategy of, of, you know, paying per pupil, paying per student that actually goes to school uh, is the best way to fund our public schools. If, if a student's not actually going to school there, uh, even if they're enrolled in that school and then they've moved or doing something different, uh, you know, we need to pay our districts based on the students that they are teaching. On an attendance, I mean, because his, his, his thought was if they give the districts money on enrollment the first day mm -hmm. or the first week and then the kid's not showing up, then there's no incentive to make sure that kid's going to school. Well, there's a number of problems with it. I mean, you know, when, when do you consider the enrollment? You know, I represent a very fast growth area. If you take enrollment on the first day of school, then, you know, my districts are losing money on that deal. 
you know, look at Aubrey, Texas, one of the fastest growing areas, not only in the state of Texas, but in the country. They are, they're gonna have students moving in all throughout the course of the school year. So, you know, when, when is that enrollment taken? I would rather see, uh, you know, districts funded based on the number of students that they're actually teaching uh, there at school. And school choice, mm -hmm. you think it's gonna pass? I do, yes sir, you absolutely. Yes sir, I do. It, look, I, and, and let me tell you why I support it. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there about what this is. You know, the bill that we had before us last session would have only been for 50,000 students out of the more than five million Texas school children. And it would have been for kids that have special needs, that their families may need a different option than what they're getting. It's for students in failing school districts, where students and families may need a different option than what they're zoned for and locked into. That's what we were talking about last session. We're not talking about you know, the, the, the talking point that this is for rich white kids that are already going to public schools. That's not what this is. We're talking about trying to provide help to the students that need it the most, to provide them with another opportunity uh, versus uh, the one that they have locally. That's what the bill was last session. There's also talk about making it universal. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and let me give you an example right here where I live and where my kids go to school. You know, I fought my local school district for 18 months to remove sexually explicit materials from their public school libraries, 18 months. You know, the superintendent sent out an email bashing me to parents in 11 paragraphs in an email about me to parents and staff members of more than 66,000 students because they, he did not want to remove sexually explicit material from the public school library. If I don't wanna send my child to an environment where they're gonna see that type of filth, either in the classroom or in the public school library or anywhere else, then I should have the ability to pull my child and to take them to a school uh, where that's not gonna be an issue. And you filed similar legislation this time around. I did, yes sir. School board, talk to me about that. Yeah, so you know, we passed historic uh, legislation last session called the Reader Act, uh, you know, that did a number of different things, but, but one of the things it did is it created for the first time ever mandatory library standards for educational resources in our public schools. Part of that bill, uh, the vendor accountability piece is being held up in the courts right now. Uh, that's gonna be going on for months and months and months. Uh, but one of the things that we filed, one of many bills related to this topic that we're filing to shore up the Reader Act this session would create an avenue for parents to appeal directly to the elected State Board of Education in Austin uh, on any library resource uh, that they choose uh, to be able to get an opinion straight from the source uh, down in Austin, elected officials in Austin versus having to appeal locally at their local school board. If they don't like that answer, this gives them another avenue to, to do it at the state level. And I wanted to ask you about uh, energy mm -hmm. because we spoke a little bit of before as it relates to schools, but there was a report that came out about uh, Texas going more nuclear yes. uh, as far as energy is concerned. Um, you like this idea. I love the idea. Why? I think it's critical. Um, I, I, I can't overstate that. I think it's critical to the future of the state. Let's put this in perspective. Our peak demand in Texas grew from 2022 to 2023 by more than our total nuclear assets that we have in Texas. So, so the, the change in peak demand grew by more than our total nuclear assets in Texas. That's how much our peak demand is growing in Texas. At the same time, the only thing that we're really seeing being built here is wind and solar that doesn't work all the time because of the massive federal subsidies. And at the same time, we haven't had a new nuclear power plant built in the United States in 30 years. Now there was one added, there was a reactor added to an existing site in Georgia last year, but not a new nuclear power plant built in the United States in 30 years. This is the cleanest, safest, lowest cost form of dispatchable energy that we could hope for in the state of Texas. And you look at where ERCOT says our future is going. They're saying that our grid is gonna grow practically double within the next decade, practically double. Well, that's also, that's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because the opportunity is, is that we, we only have a grid that's halfway built out. So how do we build the other half of that grid? I believe, and I think anyone that looks at the facts of the matter would say nuclear has to be a huge component of that. So what I'm hopeful for is that this report and Governor Abbott's uh, um, you know, legislative ideas around building incentives and building a cleaner path for nuclear to, to actually be developed here, combined with Republican wins at the federal level, both in the House and in the Senate, and certainly with Trump in the White House, that we will finally have a partner at the federal level 
that will end the bureaucracy, cut the red tape, and let nuclear thrive in the state of Texas. What about the state's existing plan for incentivizing natural gas fired power plants? Yeah, you know, I worked on that on that legislation last session. What I'll tell you is, is that I think that it's well-meaning. I think that it may have some success. But people aren't building natural gas power plants in Texas because of capital problems. People aren't building them because how do I make money at this natural gas plant over the life of the, of the project? Over the 30 to 50 years that this natural gas fired facility is gonna be in Texas, how do I make money for that 30 to 50 years when the federal government is so heavily subsidizing renewables that are crowding out the ability for these other guys to actually generate power many times of the day and actually participate in revenue streams in ERCOT. But there were a lot of applications for it. There were a lot of applications, absolutely, and, and I hope that they get built. I, I do believe that when you hand out free money or next to free money, that that will help, uh, you know, at least on the front end. But this is gonna be a long process to get these guys through, uh, to see who's actually gonna be there at the end of the process, to see who gets approved and who actually wants to build here. I'm hopeful that they, that they want to build here. But the problem remains, the federal government's interference in our marketplace is the ultimate reason why people don't want to build power plants in Texas. But the state has also provided incentives for renewables as well. I mean, it used to be bragged about. That's right. About Texas being number one in solar and number one in wind. Yeah, and, and I've fought for the last two sessions to eliminate those state incentives for uh, renewable projects, and we've been successful at that. If you look at the, the property tax abatements uh, that were given to wind power guys, uh, you know, without having to create jobs, I mean, that program was really perverted uh, into something that it shouldn't have been. Um, they, they never should have received those incentives. We fought to eliminate those, and the new abatement program for big businesses that are going to come in and invest and create jobs in Texas, the wind and the solar guys can't participate in that anymore, and we fought to eliminate that. I think that wind power has been the largest infrastructure disaster in the history of the state of Texas. Uh, users would be outraged if they realize how much their transmission delivery charges have gone up to send huge transmission lines all the way out to cheap land in West Texas to bring wind power all the way into the Metroplex, wind power that pretty much only works from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. But I've seen reports that says that's been responsible for keeping energy bills down. Is that not right? No, uh, it, that's actually a really good question uh, because it did depress prices for a while. It depressed prices so low that no one else would invest here because they can't compete. So then you fast forward to a winter storm URI or you fast forward to one of these other big winter storms or one of these big issues in the summer months and we don't have enough reliable thermal dispatchable power to supply the grid. But it, I've also seen those reports that say even last summer, mm -hmm. the wind, you know, the, the cost of wind energy lowered people's prices. Is that not accurate? No, that's not accurate. I mean, I think that what we're looking at is the difference between the market price for electricity and then the other half of your bill that nobody wants to talk about, which is the transmission delivery piece of your bill, the poles and wires piece of your bill that you pay. It's gone up astronomically because of these huge investments uh, into wind, which again, isn't built next to your city or next to your neighborhood. It's built hundreds of miles away in West Texas and you got to bring all that power in. Uh, but then you look at the fact that it did depress prices on the wholesale market, um, you know, and we were down there in 2018, 2019. But you had an issue in the summer of 2019, you fast forward to 2021 winter storm URI, you know, in 2022 prices were higher than they had been in 20 years in the state of Texas. Yet we have more renewables online than we've ever had in the history of state of Texas. You look at California, one of the most expensive markets for electricity in the country, they're predominantly renewables. This is a farce that people believe that the wind is free and that the sun is free. It doesn't work that way in reality. We have to have a backup for every megawatt of wind power and every megawatt of solar power that's on the grid. We have to have a real backup on power that's actually available when we need it. And then my last topic is the speaker's race. That's coming yes, up absolutely. in early December, as you know, uh, with the House Republican Caucus meeting. Where are you on backing either Speaker Phelan or Representative Cook? Yeah, look, I think Speaker Phelan's going to be the speaker next session, um, and I'm fully supportive of that. You know, there's been a lot made, and, and you start to hear a lot of people digging into the weeds on House processes, on how this committee's structured, or how uh, these House rules are structured. 
Nobody ever talked to me about that when I was at the door knocking doors or talking to voters or going to events in my district. Nobody talks about the minutia of House rules. Do you know why they're talking about it? They're talking about it because we're all coming off of the two most conservative sessions in the history of the state of Texas. We have passed legacy conservative reforms that Republicans only dreamed of about six years ago. We passed a ban of elective abortions in Texas, saving 50,000 babies uh, in Texas every single month. We've passed constitutional carry. Uh, you know, for the first time since Reconstruction, you don't have to ask the government's permission to keep and bear arms. The largest border security investment of any state in the history of the United States, the largest investment in property tax relief of any state in the history of the United States. Uh, you know, you look at election integrity, the strongest election integrity bills in the history of the United States and certainly of the state of Texas. We have passed so many legacy conservative wins, and that's not even to mention what we did to protect kids last session from extri uh, explicit drag shows, from dirty books in schools, pornographic websites, banning gender modification uh, for minors, surgeries and drugs, banning men from competing against women in girls' sports. We have passed so many red meat, strong legacy conservative wins that now we're debating minutia of house rules that quite frankly, the people that I represent don't care about. Well, the grassroots in the Texas GOP does, and uh, the chair of the Texas GOP is making this a big issue. And uh, where are you on the issue of no Democratic committee chair? Because that's a very big issue. Absolutely. The Republican grassroots. Yeah, you know, look, and, and I understand why it's an issue, and it's an issue because we passed so many red meat items in the last two sessions, the grifters who go out there and make money off of primary races have to drum up everybody on an issue so that they can continue to make money in the primaries. I mean, that's honestly what this is about. I think people are surprised to learn that the Texas Senate has had at least one, if not more, Democrat chairman of committees every single session that a Republican has held the lieutenant governorship and been president of the Senate. Now, I understand that lieutenant governor said that he's not gonna have them next session, because Senator Whitmire retired. Uh, and so, you know, because of the retirements that they've had, they're not gonna have Democrat chairs. Look, I don't go to Austin and love the fact that, that um, you know, Democrats have committee chairmanships. That's not something that, that I've fought for to go down to Austin to say, hey, here, you have this committee chairmanship. But I would defy anyone to tell me what red meat conservative bill that a Democrat committee chair killed last session. When I ask people that in my district, they can't name one. Do you know why? because there isn't one. Uh, Democrats typically chair committees that red meat stuff doesn't go through. They typically chair committees that aren't as much R versus D, they, they chair committees that are more urban versus rural. So it may be a transportation committee or a committee on water, where if I'm an East Texas hardcore Republican, I would have rather have had Democrat Tracy King be the chair of the water committee than Republican Jared Patterson from Frisco, Texas. You know why? Because Jared Patterson, Republican from Frisco, Texas, is going to go out to East Texas and take all that water and give it to my people here in Denton County, where we've got over a million residents and we need their water. But Democrat Tracy King from Uvalde, he's going to be a little bit more cautious on that because he's a rural member as chair of the Water Committee. So this is a dynamic issue. I think that's something that people don't recognize is the fact that for us to pass a constitutional amendment, it takes 100 votes in the House. We don't have 100 votes. We don't have 100 Republicans. We have 88 Republicans coming in this next session, and that's more than we've had in any other session that I've served in in the Texas House. So if we wanna be able to work across the aisle and get Democrats to come over and uh, vote with us on constitutional amendments on you know, things like property tax reform and expanding the homestead exemption, if we need their help to pass these constitutional amendments, then they're going to expect a say in something along the way. And so I don't like that we have Democrat chairs, but I understand why we have Democrat chairs, and it's because in the Texas House, we work very well together to accomplish the uh, you know, agenda of the majority, as I've laid out, the two most conservative sessions in history, but while also respecting the minority rights. State Representative Jared Patterson of Frisco, thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you.